everybody, it's Eric Papenfus. It's Friday, so it must be a bye day. And today, I'm off to New Jersey again for one of the largest book sales of the year. And it is there that was the scene of the crime, so to speak, because about a week ago in New Jersey, I found a book which I think is going to upend over 200 years of scholarship on Benjamin Franklin. But first, I want to say, I hope you'll like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and... We're coming off an amazing event with David Sedaris last night where we had 300 people and all these books are signed. So come on in and get your signed copy of one of America's great humor writers. You ready to get to the Franklin book? Mm -hmm. Today we're just doing one book, Amanda, oh. because that book is that interesting. And here's the book. Now, at first glance, this just looks like any French book from probably the early 18th century, if you mm -hmm. were looking at it on the spine. Uh, decorative, that's pretty much how most books in France were produced. When you open it up, you see, however, it's actually a 17th uh, century book, late 17th century, published in Amsterdam. And it is a book of logic in French. And that's maybe not so remarkable, but the reason I bought it, Amanda, was because of the ownership. And it was owned by an Elizabeth Hewson Caldwell, who then gave the book to uh, uh, her daughter, presumably Elizabeth Caldwell Jr. And I really liked the fact that you had a woman using the moniker Jr., which is unusual. And I figured any book of philosophy that was being passed down in a family from sort of one generation to another um, by the women in the family would be a very interesting story. And I wanted to learn more about who these people were. So I just bought the book. Then I went down a rabbit hole trying to figure out who Elizabeth Hewson Caldwell was. And if you Google uh, Elizabeth Houston Caldwell, you're not going to find anything. Uh, she sort of disappeared to history, as, uh, as many wives have. Um, but after searching and searching and searching, I eventually found her uh, in, of all places, a catalog of paintings by a French itinerant artist named Saint Memin, who came to Philadelphia and Baltimore and the East Coast and did sketches of famous people around circa 1800. And here she is, Eliza, she went by, and Miss Hewson. Interestingly, um, she was already married at the time this was done to Caldwell, but she still goes by Miss Hewson, at least in St. Mamin's uh, book. Having discovered exactly who she was, I was then able to determine who her parents were. And her parents were an anatomist, a famous scientist uh, named William Hewson and a woman by the name of Polly Stevenson. And Polly Stevenson is famous in Franklin scholarship because she was the daughter of Benjamin Franklin's landlord <laughs> when uh, Benjamin Franklin was living in England in all of those years leading up to the American Revolution. Now, not a lot is known about, uh, about that time other than what Benjamin Franklin writes in his letters. And he writes the most incredibly flirtatious letters you'll ever see to Polly Stevenson. Um, dozens and dozens of letters. And it's very clear that uh, Benjamin Franklin had more than just uh, an, uh, a plain connection to this 18-year-old beauty, uh, Polly Stevenson, who he met. Now, this contrasts with the letters he's writing to his own wife back in America <laughs> and his own daughter, uh, telling them to be thrifty and not spend too much money. And, oh, he writes, he writes to Polly about um, how he's going to teach her all the philosophy that she needs to know. She knitted him garters. He wrote back and said, I, I will think of you in the wearing, uh, just as you did of me in the making. Oh I mean, it was, it was pretty scandalous. Now, traditional scholarship says, well, you know, you can't prove anything. Uh, there was never necessarily anything going on between Polly Stevenson and Franklin, despite those letters. But there is one interesting piece of evidence, and that is uh, Franklin had all sorts of visitors at this apartment where, uh, where he was living with uh, Polly and Polly's mother. And uh, among them, you know, Joseph Priestley, famous um, uh, diplomats, but even young American artists like Charles Wilson Peale, who was an American portrait artist who came all the way over from Annapolis and he wanted to introduce himself to Franklin. And the story that Peale tells, uh, by the way, here is Polly. This is a picture of Polly. So you can see Polly. And um, this is Polly's daughter, Eliza. And Peale uh, apparently walks in on Franklin um, one day when he's coming to the, to the apartment and he sees uh, through the crack in the door a young lady on mm. Franklin's lap. And here's what he sketches, Peel does in his sketchbook, which was not known until fairly recently. 
quite a striking resemblance, I would say, between Polly and, um, and this is, of course, Franklin. And then on the back of the sketch, that sketch, there's an even more scandalous sketch, a sketch not often reproduced, Amanda, but here it is, uh -oh. Charles Wilson Peel with Polly on Franklin's lap, Polly's hand in a certain position, Franklin's hands in a certain position. This is really in Charles Wilson Peel's sketchbook. Now, I think we can safely say there was uh, more than just a simple relationship between Benjamin Franklin and Polly Stevenson. Um, when you couple this sketch with the letters, and then you have to ask yourself, well, now wait a minute, there was also a hastily arranged marriage between Hewson and Polly. Now, Houston, I told you, was an anatomist, he was a scientist, he was far more interested in Franklin and what Franklin could do for his career mm. than he was in Polly. And what's really interesting is that he is married very, very quickly to Polly. Polly writes Franklin a letter saying, I'm never going to get married. <laughs> and Franklin says, well, you never know, someday. And then all of a sudden she's like, I'm getting married. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then quite soon after she has uh, her children. And uh -oh. I will contend that uh, it is a possibility, that even though Franklin was up in years at the time, that these were, in fact, Franklin's children. And that makes Eliza here Benjamin Franklin's daughter. Hewson dies very quickly. Uh, he spent all of his nights in the basement of this, uh, uh, in the garden as well of this, uh, of this house where he was cutting up bodies to learn anatomy, of course, but he ends up getting sepsis and he dies. And after the American Revolution, what happens to Polly? Polly goes um, and lives first with Franklin in France and brings Eliza and, and, and Franklin begins to have a relationship with Eliza in France and then back to Philadelphia where she lives again, next to Franklin, and is at Franklin's bedside when Franklin dies. Mm. And Eliza is actually mentioned in Franklin's will, um, which is a pretty remarkable thing, uh, and is given, uh, given a piece of property, uh, as are uh, Polly's other male children, and they are given books from Franklin's library. Let's return to this book, Amanda. Mm -hmm. This book is an important book for Franklin because this book is called The Port Royal Logic. And it's a work of Cartesian philosophy. Pascal contributed to it. It's considered the most important early modern book on philosophy. And Benjamin Franklin, in his autobiography, mentions two books that he reads as a teenager that shape his, his, his entire life. And they are John Locke and the Port Royal Philosophy. Perfect book, I would say, for giving a young 18-year-old lady who you're trying to teach philosophy to, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say. Now, um, it's also an important book for Franklin because he gives the American translation of this book to the Library Company of Philadelphia. Franklin founds that library in 1730, um, and this is like the first book that he gives, gives to the library, which is a pretty remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. So the book has significance to Franklin. It's the type of book that he would have used to teach Polly philosophy. Did Polly hold on to the book? And then was the book passed on to her daughter and then to her granddaughter? And I think uh, the likelihood of that is very strong. I'm going to say one thing about Franklin's library. Polly, after Franklin dies, uh, is sort of overseeing the debate that people were having about what should happen to the books and who should get the library. Um, and all Franklin's books had shelf marks in them. And it wasn't until about 20 years ago that a librarian at the Library Company of Philadelphia discovered that you could recreate uh, Franklin's library because he didn't put his name in his books very often by uh, identifying which books had shelf marks. And um, those were the books that were part of his American library and they corresponded to the cases in his home in Philadelphia. We don't know what happened to the books that he had, when, which he surely bought and surely used in that apartment in England. There is a shelf mark in this book. It is a different type of shelf mark. If you look at the front of the book, you can see a B++. What does that mean? Bureau to the right of the bureau? Does it, who knows what it means? Um, but was this a book that Franklin gave? I, th I think so. And if so, I think we need some DNA testing, Amanda. Let me know in the, in the comments on this video if you were convinced that, in fact, Benjamin Franklin may have fathered uh, Eliza Hewson Caldwell. We're going to end with a funny book. It is a scandalous book. It reminded me a little bit of Franklin because what a title. It's too naked for the Nazis. And this is a biography written about a, uh, a British dancer who ends up uh, becoming a war correspondent. There she is in contrast, uh, covering the Nazis. And it scandalizes uh, Hermann Goring and others, not so much because of the negative coverage of the Nazis, but because of her past. Who doesn't want to read a book like Too Naked? for the Nazis. 
All right, well, thanks for watching. I hope you watch next Friday and every Friday for more adventures in the world of books.